you to another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's Medical Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Todorovic, joined by this guy, Dr. Matt Barton. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, uh, friends and family. Australia won the World Cup. In? Cricket. Okay. I think every time we start a podcast, that's how you begin. Australia has won a World Cup. No, Australia didn't even make the semis in the rugby. Oh, that's right. But they Who beat, won that? They, New Zealand. Uh, South Africa. Oh, okay. So Australia just won the Cricket World Cup. Beat India. India didn't lose one game through the whole series and then they lost the final. Really? Yeah. But they still had won it. No, Australia won the World Cup. That's what I said. But oh, India didn't win, yeah, lose one. That's right. Oh, but lost against Australia. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, as somebody who doesn't understand <laughs> anything about cricket and probably the majority of our audience as well, uh, let's move on. Um, I, I had, in other news, yeah. I, I had a bout of gastro. Oh. Would you like to tell us that in detail? Do you really want me to, or is that just sarcasm? And Can saying, I tell the audience about your physiological I think they know it. abnormality? So Matt, when Matt vomits, is it just vomiting? Just vomiting. So when Matt vomits, he tends to pass out. So Matt has what's called a vago vasal uh, vaso vagal syncope, which is uh, upon a very strong activation of his vagus nerve, which tends to happen due to the Valsalva manoeuvre, forceful contraction, stimulation, uh, something like uh, doing a hard poo. I don't get that. Well, I generally don't have that issue. Well, you eat a lot of vegetables. From, from the other end. Um, or vomiting, it stimulates the vagus nerve, which changes the diameter of the blood vessels, and the blood doesn't make it to his brain fast enough. And because he's 18 foot tall, it happens very quickly, and he passes out. Didn't your wife find you on the lawn, <laughs> unconscious on the lawn, <laughs> naked, just covered in your own vomit? More or less, more or less. Wow. So, um, why were you on the lawn? A bit of a backstory. Yeah. Um, my not my the da- diarrhea. My do- no. Oh. My daughter had gastro the week before. Yeah. And I managed that through the whole night. So, it was, so you were the one doing the cleaning. That's right. Ah. On the hour, every hour, there was vomiting. Yeah. Clothes changing, bed sheet changing. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I thought I, I made it through without succumbing to this virus. So a whole uh, week, virus. Whole week yeah. went past. Close to it. Wow. Yep. And then Sunday, which actually was my birthday. Oh, it was. I remember sending you a message saying happy birthday and you said, I've got gastro. And I went, oh, no, because I know that that means time to get unconscious. So, <laughs> and usually for people that would mean getting drunk yeah. and going silly, but for you it means uh, getting gastro and passing out That's on the right. lawn in your own vomit. So I woke up not feeling the best, went to a, um, a birthday party in the park. Did you? With his family, and then I just started feeling off. For you? For me. So it's to celebrate you. Correct. <laughs> Went home. I started to go, oh, I think I've progressed past. You know how sometimes you just feel a bit nauseous? Yeah. And then you go, uh, No, this is illness. This is it. Yeah. So then I sat outside for a little while, thought maybe uh, I will Are feel better. Are you back better. home or at the park? I'm back at home now. All right. And then it got to the point I'm, I'm like, this is going to be vomiting. Right. But I really don't want to initiate it by yeah. just sticking my fingers down my throat. Yeah. And so I thought, oh, to be safe, I'll go and stand on, not stand, squat on the lawn. Right. Squat. Hands, hands and knees. Okay. And so then oh, the, you poor the telltale signs of it getting near the, the vomiting, sweating. Clamminess. That's right. So I'm you like, feel oh. so like physically uncomfortable. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And then <laughs> all I remember is then my wife yelling at me going, I don't know what she was saying, actually. Um, I'm here, I'm here. Do the like, dishes! I'm, I'm here, I'm here, something like wow. that. Wow. And so... How long were you so I didn't for? even I didn't even uh, recall the action of about to vomit, which is what usually happens. So did you vomit? Was there vomit on the I vomited, ground? yeah. Yeah. But usually I'm, I'm about to start vomiting yeah. and then I pass out. But this time I didn't even get to that point. So were you on the vomit? Yeah. <laughs> and so my wife, she found me oh, passed no. out on the lawn. You poor, this is horrible. And uh, so the way I experienced it was you lose all vision. Yeah. So everything's dark. Yeah. But you can hear. Mm. So your your sense of hearing is, must be retained reasonably well. Yeah. Presumably vision's a highly energ- energetic process. Yeah. So you'll lose that quickly. But then I could hear my wife. 
but then you have this feeling, I had this feeling of significant dread. Right. Like, like I'm You'd been trapped, taken into the void. I'm trapped. Yeah. Almost like underwater and you're trying to get to the surface. Yeah, K-hole. Yeah, like a ketamine trip. So that was my feeling. Wow. But, but then you could almost get back a little bit of consciousness each wave that I suspect was the blood coming back. Yeah. So it's kind of in these pulses that's getting more, more, more. Jeez. Then vision comes, but you're still disorientated. And then more and more and then I go, oh, okay, I've passed out. But still it, it seems seems strange. Different world. But then I fully So did you them. have to vomit again after that? One more. And you passed out? Yeah. Wow. And so and how long does it take for you to recover from the passing out? It seems like a long time for me. Yeah. But to be, my wife said about 20 seconds. Oh, okay. And then wow. in that, my daughter, oh two, two and a half year old daughter, she saw it and then she got, got upset. really upset. And of she ran inside crying because she thought her dad had Was, carked it. Wow, okay. Well, that's... So the whole experience wasn't great. You, uh, I would be so worried about getting gastro. I do. Yeah. And that's, I think, what makes it all worse because yeah. you know... What to expect. The outcome. Ugh, horrible. Mm. Well, we're not talking about gastro today, Matt, so that's good. So no sympathetic passing out for us, please. And when I say sympathetic, I don't mean sympathetic nervous system. Uh, we are talking about inflammation and we're talking about some of the drugs or pharmaceuticals that can be used to address the inflammatory response. So we call them anti-inflammatory drugs. And there's a Good name. probably a significant overlap between anti-inflammatory drugs and its use in for other reasons like antipyretic, so stopping fever, analgesic, stopping pain, and other mechanisms. So autoimmune or anti-immune? Anti-immune as well. Immune suppressive. So when we think about inflammation, there's a couple of things I want to talk about to begin with, and then we can probably talk about the process of inflammation, the chemicals that are released, and then we can talk about the various drugs that are currently on the market that address inflammation. What do you think? Like it. All right. So to begin, if we were to define inflammation in to, to be as succinct as we possibly can, I tend to tell my students that inflammation is damage to vascularized tissue. What do you think about that? Yep. Okay. And the reason why I say that and, and make sure I put that little addendum in as to saying vascularized tissue instead of just damage to tissue is because inflammation is a vascular response. Yes. And so the importance of that is... But it, saying that most tissue is vascularized, right? Yeah, it is. There's uh, not many that isn't. But the reason why that needs to be stated or importantly should be stated is because there's some tissues that aren't as vascular as others like cartilage. And so when you have damage to, to cartilage, there is an inflammatory response but it can take a long time and it can take a long time for that tissue to heal mm -hmm. because, as we're about to find out, inflammation is important for tissue healing. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. All right. Very important. So, Actually, I think the early physicians thought that was its whole role. It's just a healing process. Yeah, and in part it is, but it does a bunch of other stuff. So uh, inflammation is great in the short term. Uh, it facilitates fighting off infection. So, you know, clearing of pathogens, cleaning that area or clearing the area away of debris uh, and rebuilding and facilitating the process of wound healing. So inflammation can... And, and notifying you there's a problem. Yes, to, to basically say, look, I'm healing this tissue. Maybe don't use it as extensively as you would. So protect it. Which is the fifth cardinal sign of inflammation. So, okay, let's, we won't go to the cardinals yet but we will talk about those cardinal signs of inflammation. Um, so tell me if you like this analogy, right? When, well, okay, so firstly, when you get inflammation, it can be local or systemic. Yep. So you could cut your hand, damage the vascularized tissue, tissue, you have a localised inflammation. Or you can have something happening within your body, so damage uh, a damaged organ or an infection, like a bacterial or viral infection, and it can lead to systemic Inflammation. Well, partly that's what I had on the weekend. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. So you would have had a viral gastrointestinal viral I would imagine infection. Viral, yep. And you would have had a, a systemic uh, inflammatory response. Yep. So, regardless of whether it's local or, or systemic, the effects it has on the body is to basically conserve energy and to allocate nutrients to the activated immune system. So, you 
you are going, your body is experiencing something that it normally wouldn't and you can feel a little bit sick. You can get what's called sickness behaviours. Uh, these include things like sadness, um, uh, uh, anhedonia, which is an inability to experience pleasure or you have this lack of so interest. This is, you're saying behavioural changes yeah, or so systemic changes? Uh, so these are some behavioural and, cis, and these are some behavioural and physiological things that occur to you when you can get inflammation, whether local or systemic. So that sadness, that anhedonia, fatigue, reduced libido and reduced food intake, altered sleep and altered socio-behavioural uh, uh, responses. But you can also get things like increased blood pressure, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia. Myalgia. Myalgia. So that's muscle-based pain. And so, joint pain. Yep. So pain generally. And... The thing about this is it's all supposed, while they can be uncomfortable and And you probably also say fever. And fever. Um, it's short term, right? It's mm. supposed to be short term. And so the reason why is I like to think about it as though, um, let's say a building has fallen down in a city, right? So the city functions the way that a city functions. It's high paced. Many things are happening, but it's basically quite efficient. But when a building falls down, it's going to disrupt the functioning of that city. So the city is the analogy of the body? Yes. Okay, and a, a building's fallen down. Okay, Damage so to vascularised tissue. Yep. So when it falls down, it needs to be fixed. Otherwise, it's going to, if it remains broken, it's going to limit the way that the roads work, limit the way the city functions, you're not going to be able to import, export things properly, people's lives will be disrupted. So it needs to be fixed. But while that building building is getting fixed, you need to cordon off roads, you need to get in a, a cleaning team. You need to get in a, re, a builders and rebuild that building again. And while these things are happening, the city is diverting resources to that process. So the city might, for a short period of time while it's getting fixed, be dysfunctional. Have ill effects. Yeah, so people need to travel to work through roundabout ways and people are going to be disrupted and it's not going to be great, but it's because this thing's getting fixed in the short term. So that's the way I like to think about it. It's all short term. But the problem is, and what, what you'd want to think is that once it's fixed, you no longer experience the side effects of that inflammation. So all those effects. But what can happen is that, and this is something that is we should all be aware of, more than 50% of deaths worldwide can be attributed to a chronic inflammatory Disease or disorder. Okay, so when does it become chronic? It's all about time frame. So when? About three months. Three months. Yes. So inflammation that lasts less than three months, we call acute, and we tend to think about it as though, okay, this is happening for a purpose, and that purpose is to clear the area, get rid of any pathogens, uh, and facilitate rebuilding of that tissue so that everything is as normal as it possibly can be. So to maintain homeostasis. Yep. Right? But if it goes for too long, then the process becomes maladaptive and it can just maintain and it basically self-modulates uh, and can amplify and can continue and it doesn't get fixed, right? Mm -hmm. So th this is a problem. Yeah. So if you, so acute inflammation is like and hanging out just, okay. with you, right? It, good, hanging out with good you. Good looking. No, no, no. No, not, not uh, acute. <laughs> uh, acute. Oh, sorry. So hanging out with you. Great in the short term, right? Enjoyable. Hanging out with you long term, one of the worst things on the planet. Fibrotic. Potentially. Yeah. So this is like, you are like inflammation. Great in the short term, horrible in the long term. And these deaths... Compliment accepted. <laughs> I'm glad that's how you saw it. So these deaths that can be attributed to chronic inflammatory disease, things like stroke and cancer and diabetes and heart disease, fatty liver disease, kidney disease, autoimmune diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, all of them have been shown to have an inflammatory basis to it. Yeah. But tends to be chronic inflammation. Yeah. So whole point of saying all of this is because it's important for us to understand the process of inflammation and how it should be and how it should function appropriately and the types of drugs that clinicians will commonly prescribe to help address inflammation to hopefully try and stop it from getting any worse. Okay. And these are what we call anti-inflammatory drugs, which again is the focus of today. Right. And so in, in terms of these anti-inflammatory drugs, are they generally going to be applied 
for acute inflammation opposed to chronic or they can have applications in chronic? Both. Okay. But generally, it would be to reduce the effects that acute inflammation can have, such as if you go for a run and you get a, an ankle sprain, uh, it might be extremely painful. And the pain is obviously there to say, hey, stay off the ankle yeah. while we fix this. Yeah. But the pain could be quite annoying. Yes. And the pain would generally be caused, well, it could be caused due to uh, direct stimulation of the nociceptors that stimulate the pain, or it could be caused due to the pro-inflammatory chemicals that are released that is changing how easy it is to send the nociceptive Well, that was going to be a question that I had with your city analogy. Yeah. How are all these different systems communicating with, with each other? So how does Chemically. the... Just how does the, uh, you know, well, not the destructive... What do you call the demolition team? Demolition team. Yeah. How do they know? How do the builders know to come in to now build some new, build the building again? They all need to make phone calls, yeah. right? And so these phone calls are the chemical messengers, right? And so inflammation is mediated by chemical messengers, and the whole inflammatory process again, if we think about it, getting rid of anything that shouldn't be there, clearing the area of debris, and facilitating rebuilding. That happens because of the chemicals that are released. But some of the off-target effects can include stimulating or making it a lot easier to experience pain. And so one of the reasons why people take anti-inflammatory medications isn't really necessarily to stop the inflammation, but to stop the pain that is caused right. by the inflammation. But the way that we can do that is by stopping some of those chemicals that promote inflammation. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, again... Uh, Inflammation can be good in the short term, and again, it's context dependent. So, uh, but inflammation can be quite bad in the long term. Yeah. So it really is a balance between how much of this inflammatory response do you want to stop or not. Now, sometimes acute inflammation can kill you. Yes. Right. So again, that's why I'm saying it's context dependent. And, I, and a good example of that mm. is what we saw in the short term effects of COVID. Yes. So yes. We, we, for those individuals that progressed into a serious, um, what, what do they call it, a cytokine storm, yep. they pretty much had their entire lung fields inflamed. Yeah. Which then meant the lungs, if they're filled with fluid, they're not going to do their job. Yeah. And so that could then lead to death for the individual because they just can't gas exchange anymore. Yeah. The body is trying. It's doing what it has evolved to do, which is have an inflammatory response to kill the virus, get rid of the virus, clear the damaged area and rebuild. But the problem is the location and to the extent in which it was led to, it's like, it, it is this fine balancing yeah, yeah. act. And right? I think we, we saw that with a lot of um, ill effects of the COVID is possibly more due to your immune system yeah. than the virus. Yeah. Yeah, because your immune system is maybe just overreacting in a way that becomes now harmful to your body. Yes, yeah, that, I think that's I think that's fair to say. So we probably should talk about the inflammatory process from start to finish uh, and the various chemicals that are released because at the end of the day, these anti-inflammatory drugs try and stop these chemicals. So we need yep. to sort of talk about what they are. But if we uh, use that definition that pain is damage to vascularized tissue. Is there a pain or inflammation? Oh, sorry, inflammation is uh, due to damage to vascularized tissue. Um, how do you want to begin? Like a, some sort of trauma, some wound? Like yeah. So I've got what I tell my students. I give them a acronym. Yep. Called HATING. H A T I N G. Okay. And that's yep. all the triggers of acute inflammation. And they would easily remember that because they hate your guts. That's right, they hate my guts. Yeah. So hate, as an example, would be hypoxic injury. Right. So, in so these are all the causes of cause. inflammation. That's right. Okay. So what is it? Hypoxic injury. So that's a H. Yeah. Yeah. A, aging-based. So this would be, you know, individuals, and I think you spoke about this a number of times, when we get older. Reduced physiological reserves. Physiological reserve. reserves. So that you're more likely to go into a state of injury. Okay, so just to clarify that point for the for the our one dear listener, um, it's not aging itself that is causing the inflammatory response, but the fact that something that would normally be innocuous or non-damaging to the tissue for somebody of a younger age, 
the buffering capacity for that thing is no longer there when you get older. And so it could potentially cause an inflammatory response. Yep. So this could be exposure to certain chemicals um, or whatever it may be. So yep. that's what you mean, right? That's what I mean. So that's age-related. Yep. So T. hypoxic, age-related T. So this could be toxin, All right. toxins. That's easy. It could be trauma. Oh, so multiple T's. Yeah, okay. and it could even be temperature. Right, thermal. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I... Yes, that's, yeah. next, that's next, right? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, that is infection. Makes sense. Pathogens. Or infectious agents. Yep. Yep. So virus, bacteria, fungi, yep. Yep. helminths. All right. Yep. Uh, N, nutritional deficits. Ooh. Do you so, have an example here? Well, if you had, um, let's say, a, a deficit in vitamin C, and we don't see it very common anymore, but yep. if you were to see that, that... You don't know any pirates. <laughs> oh well, I think they. I can think they have access to vitamin C now on the high seas. Really? Yeah. Well, good on but, them. But but the vitamin C has a role in collagen production. I think. Yes. Which is important for epithelial maintenance and mucosal maintenance. And if you are deficient in that, you'll have those things start to break down. Yeah, you get tissue breakdown, and tissue breakdown is damage to vascularized tissue, mm -hmm. and so you can then you're more likely to get infection. And so forth. Okay, so that makes sense. Vitamin C. So make sure you eat your vegetables. And I think they used to... Even proteins. I mean, if you were protein deficient, you would have... Captain Cook uh, put in like um, fermented cabbage. Not sure. He was one of the very first to adopt the vitamin C. He didn't know it was vitamin C, but knew that it was something about um, a nutrient that was causing scurvy. Yeah. And he made sure that on his trip, for example to Australia or this particular area, that his uh, ships were filled with, uh, I think it was fermented cabbage, which had vitamin C in yeah. it. Yeah. And an interesting side point here, and I remember reading this some time ago, just talking about, you know, the importance of uh, vitamins and minerals and trace elements and so forth. Yeah. There is this kind of erroneous belief that if you, because we're talking about collagen here, which is important, for with proteins. Proteins and rebuilding. And so some individuals think if you just eat collagen, mm. therefore you you will replenish collagen. Yeah, but if you were – and it wouldn't matter how much collagen you ate, if you did it with vitamin C deficient, you would have this condition. Very true. So you could just only eat collagen yeah. and it wouldn't make a difference. And at the end of the day, if you were to take – because there are supplements that are collagen protein. That's what, right? that's what I was referring yeah. to, yeah. They're just made up of amino acids because yeah, collagen's right. a protein. And when you take it, your body will break it down into those amino acids. And guess what? We've only got 20 amino acids to make yeah. every protein in the body. So it's going to be utilised where it thinks it's best to be utilised. That's right. And if you don't need collagen, probably not going to be made into collagen. Mm. Anyway, not the point, but then, that's a good aside. And then the G is genetic uh, abnormalities, I guess, yeah. which yeah. would again lead to a immune or, anti or inflammatory response. Yeah, so you can have lack of... So you can have a gene that results in a, a loss of function of a protein and that loss of function could increase your likelihood for inflammation or damage. And you can have the opposite, a gain of function. It changes the function of the protein and it could make it pro-inflammatory or its effects could damage tissues of the body which then result in inflammation. So I like your hating. That's quite good. Not bad. I mean, it's not great, but it's it's all right. I mean, you, people do say in all the emails that I make the best uh, mnemonics and acronyms and initialisms. Not when it came to... No, that's what all of them said. So let's move on. Wet, wet bed. Wet bed. You wet your bed? That was a great one. Oh, okay, okay, so anything that can cause a tissue injury yeah. will start the process of inflammation off. So what is the very first process? So... Um, well, the injurious agent will start the process rolling. Yep. Now, in most cases, one of the first cells that will respond to injury will be in locations where you're most likely to encounter an injurious agent. Okay, so skin. Th this is where we're exposed to the outside world. So right. skin, um, mucous membranes. Yep, connective and, tissue. Yep, and so what we have are some immune cells that are kind of sitting within tissue right. that are kind of... Uh, just ready to inform the body that there's a problem. Yeah. And so they're sentries. They're, they're yeah. there waiting, watching to see what's about to enter. Yeah. And one really good example of a cell that does that is what we call a mast cell. 
So mast cells. Mast. Mast. Like the like mast of a ship. Ship. Oh. Yep. And so they um, they actually have preformed granules within them, which are Sorry? they have granules yeah. of a protein. You know, there's a number of different chemicals that they have. But the really well um, example, a good example for this granule is histamine. Okay. Okay. Histamine is preformed, so it's already within the intracellular space of this cell. And any one of those. Oh, so it's um, not in the cell. It's in the cell. Oh, you said intracellular. Intracellular. Sorry, I thought you said inter. So, okay. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So they're sitting there already preformed, and any one of those interest agents that we went through with the hating has the potential to tell the mast cells to degranulate. So is, is it because it's directly damaging the mast cell or is it because something's telling the mast cell to release the histamine? Yeah, I think um, both. Oh, yes, but okay. So I think in many cases a, a mast cell can be primed to be an, a, have an allergic reaction. Right. So we could, you know, a very common form of acute inflammation from mast cells are allergy-based. Yes. And so you've already, um, what's the word, sensitised them to that allergen. So you didn't say allergen in your hating. Oh, you could add that in the A. Oh, okay. We'll just post hoc, add it to the A. What was the A originally? <laughs> uh, ageing. Ageing. So yeah. you can have ageing and allergen. Yeah. So because that was going to be my next point is that let's just say you have an injurious agent to tissue yeah. and it could be a cut or whatever but you don't necessarily need to have an injurious agent to stimulate mast cells. You can That's have correct. something that, uh, like you said, could well, be It's pollen. innocuous, isn't it? It's a, yeah, so yeah. it could be just the pollen from a tree that you inhale and it doesn't damage the tissue right. directly, but what it can do is it can stimulate the mast cells to release histamine. Yeah. So are you saying that histamine is one of the many pro-inflammatory chemicals that are released? Correct. Released from mast cells yep. and they can be released due to either... Damage? Any, any one of those things I just mentioned. Or, or allergens. Yeah, that's right. Mostly allergens though, right? It's very common in that response. But in theory, if you were to mechanically annoy a mast cell, yeah. it will also release its contents. Including histamine. Yep. Okay. Well, that's, that's exactly what I was meaning, yeah. Okay. But you could have other chemicals that will come in and, are, you know, are relatively innocuous that will cause a mast cell to degranulate without having to be... Um, prime to it. So like morphine is a good, good example. All right. Morphine for some people will annoy mast cells yep. and they will get like allergy responses to morphine. It's itchiness. Itchiness is right. a good example. All right. So we've got, so this is just one chemical, but there's heaps of chemicals yeah. that are released during this process of damage to vascularized tissue. I think the, the important point I'm just emphasizing here, because the, the chemical is already pre-made, yeah. it can be released very quickly and have a very immediate effect. And histamine has a very strong effect on vascular tissue, right. so it will cause it to dilate. And so pretty quickly in this inflammatory response, is blood vessels start dilating. Why? Why would you want a blood vessel to dilate? In inflammation, well, you want to bring blood to the area because what's in blood, it's going to have nutrients and yep. all the important stuff to remake cell that's, in your case, the city or the building that's broken or yep. fallen down, you want to bring all the important things to it. But also it's going to kind of notify we need to bring in the fixer elements to that region. So white blood cells. White blood cells. So these are fighting off the infection but also helping clear the that's area. That's right. And also platelets, which can help if the Particularly blood vessel if a, itself is damaged. That's right. It can help repair that damaged blood yep. vessel as well. So, all right, so... You're saying that the very, pretty much once the, once, and we're only using one chemical at the moment, but we'll go through the others. But once this first chemical is released, you get vasodilation. Should we talk about the other chemicals? And then, yeah. okay, so. But the really, the stressor I'm putting here is the preform granules like yeah. histamine and serotonin. First one to be released. Play the immediate response yeah. to this. And then what comes in now are mediators yeah. that have to be made. Okay. Okay. So. There is this inflammatory soup that gets produced during this process. And like you said, histamine is definitely one that comes first, but there's others like serotonin and glutamate and adenosine and substance P and calcitonin gene-related peptide called CGRP, bradykinins, prostaglandins, thromboxane, leukotrienes, endocannabinoids, nerve growth factors, tumor necrosis factors, interleukins, extracellular proteases and protons. Amazing. Right? 
Just that's just me- mentioning some. So all of these are termed pro-inflammatory chemicals, yeah. and can not just stimulate the inflammatory or exacerbate the inflammatory process, but they can also stimulate and exacerbate the nociceptive process for us to res- uh, experience pain. Yeah. All right. So knowing that there's a bunch of chemicals. Uh, let's talk about a subset of them yeah. and the main effects that they produce so that we can talk about the cardinal signs of inflammation that we all know and hate. <laughs> so what would you say are the major chemicals that are involved in the inflammatory process? I, I listed a bunch that have been implicated, but what would you say are some of the important ones? So, yeah, these are now the, the ones that have to be made. So prostaglandins is a huge one. Yeah. Okay. So then you'd have the leukotrins yep. um, and then the cytokines. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That would be my yep. ones to focus on. What about bradykinin? Bradykinin, yep. So yep. bradykinin comes from other locations though, right? Doesn't it come from the liver? Well, originally it's formed in the liver, but it's circulating through the plasma. Okay. And, it, and in the tissues as well. And so I would say, generally speaking... If I were to summarise some of the important pro-inflammatory chemicals for us to talk about the inflammatory response and the cardinal signs, I would say histamine, bradykinins and prostaglandins Mm -hmm. um, and probably a bit of nitric oxide, but it's not really a pro-inflammatory chemical, but it can um, sort of uh, synergistically amplify the inflammatory response. But let's just talk about some of the main mechanisms broadly what these chemicals do, right? So you mentioned the first one is that you said histamine vasodilates. Mm. So does bradykinin, mm. so does prostaglandins. So at the site of injury, blood vessels are dilating, yep. getting more blood to the area. Yep. The second thing they do is they make that blood vessel, because it's usually a, compi- a capillary bed, more permeable, mm-hmm. right? So it just makes it more porous, more easier leaky. for things to leak out. Because when there's not an inflammatory state, what things come out of the blood vessel and what don't? Purely plasma only. Which constitutes what? What's in plasma? What's well, about 55% of your blood um, volume. Yep. Uh, it's mostly just water with small dissolved uh, electrolytes in it. So sodium, potassium, calcium, yeah. chloride, but there's also nutrients like glucose uh, and yeah. there's also gases. Yes, that's right. So generally speaking, they're pretty much the only things in a non-inflammatory state that leaves a capillary bed because they need to feed the tissues. That's right. Uh, and then there's things that come into the capillary bed like wastes and gases and... From, from, the, cell well, from the cell, cell itself. From the cell itself. Yeah, yeah. And they're usually the things that get exchanged. But when you release these pro-inflammatory chemicals, one, more blood is getting to that tissue. Yep, so that's two, vasodilation. Two, the things that don't usually escape like proteins and cells, yep. red blood cells, white blood cells and proteins... They can now escape. But I will say this, that in terms of, I mean, red blood cells shouldn't escape unless there's been damage to the blood vessel. Mm -hmm. Platelets shouldn't escape unless there's been damage to the blood vessel. White blood cells shouldn't escape. However, they have the possibility, only a couple of them, Mm -hmm. of squeezing their way through the the cell itself, opposed to just... um, floating through the blood vessel like, say, the plasma proteins would. Yes. So I think that's a really good point. So even though it's become more permeable, it's not like it's just it's made the holes to the sieve bigger so now everything falls out. Proteins definitely will come out. Yeah, right? yeah. So that's that's an important thing to say. Uh, and proteins have a negative charge associated with them. And we know that from previous podcasts, anything that has a charge or a significant charge associated with it will drag water with it. So the fact that proteins leave mean, means water leaves as well, right, or the plasma leaves. Um, the, like you said, the red blood cells and the platelets, they don't leave, and some white blood cells do, and the reason is because they undergo this process of chemotaxis where mm-hmm. because of all these things are leaking out of the blood vessel and you've got all these chemicals now creating this soup outside of the blood vessel because it's saying, hey, this is an inflammatory, this area is damaged, the white blood cells sniff it out and they squeeze themselves through these yeah. slightly larger doorways. So if... if, it, if oh, those a process chem- called di- diapodesis. That's yeah. right. And so-, so they squeeze their way through because they're following that chemical gradient. Red blood cells don't follow that chemical gradient. So they could potentially squeeze themselves through 
but they've, there's no desire to do so. And I shouldn't say that any cells have a desire, but it's not following a gradient. Yeah, I, don't th- I also don't think red blood cells have the capacity based on their membrane. I think their membrane is such that they just rem- remain in a kind of a, a donut shape yeah. until they get destroyed by the spleen or something. But yeah. white blood cells act a bit more like amoeba yeah. where they can kind of move along. Yep. They their squeeze their way through. So the doorways are just slightly more open. And so it can now squeeze its way through. Now you've got white blood cells out in that area. So two things, increased vaso, uh, I- increased blood to the area. So that will give redness. So, yeah, now the area's become more red because it's hot. more blood. And it's hotter because so the, blood contains our body heat. These are the heat. first two cardinal signs. Yep. You've now got increased vascular permeability, so things are leaking out, including fluid. So that's swelling now. So now you've got swelling in the area or edema. Mm-hmm. And now, because of all these things in that localised area, chemicals, increased pressure, other substances, it can stimulate nociceptors, which are the receptors that send a signal to the brain to give you that overall experience of pain. You can now get pain as well. So how many is that? That's four. Um, And then then you add the fifth, which is a combination of pain and the area swollen, and that is going to lead to a loss of function. Yeah. There you go. Which is what you spoke about at the start with, you know, the the rolled ankle. So redness, heat, pain, swelling and loss of function. Yep. They're the five cardinal signs of inflammation. And they're all mediated because of the chemicals that are released. Yes. All right. So I mentioned heaps of chemicals. And if we're talking about anti-inflammatory drugs, an argument could be made by our one very intelligent listener. Now, I'm not saying we only have one intelligent listener. I'm just saying we've only got one listener. And that that listener (laughs) is intelligent. Um, If we happen to have more listeners, uh, they'll all be intelligent. So I just needed to (laughs) make that statement before I start to get emails. Email. Uh, So I said things like serotonin, histamine, glutamate, adenosine, substance P, CGRP, bradykinins, prostaglandins, thromboxane. Oh, my gosh, so many. Protons, right? So hydrogen ions. Potassium. Potassium. ATP. Yep. So an argument could be made that we could have a drug that addresses all of them and it would address inflammation. True. But there's some that aren't just pro-inflammatory only. They are, they do other things like ATP, for example. You don't want to kill ATP off. No, last thing you want to do is antagonise ATP. There goes your energy. You don't want to stop playing around with electrolytes, potassium and hydrogen ions, because we know we need a very fine balance of those for nerve conduction, for pH balance, for muscle contraction, for a whole range of things. So we're not playing with those then. So that knocks them out of the park for being targets for drug interventions as anti-inflammatories. You could go, okay, what about the neurotransmitters like uh, serotonin and substance P and glutamate? Great, that's a good idea. But none of these are pain-specific or, sorry, inflammatory-specific neurotransmitters. neurotransmitters. So, for example, glutamate is the major... Um, stimulatory neurotransmitter. So if you were to stop glutamate or stop it from binding, you're not just going to stop inflammation and the subsequent pain that's happening. You're going to stop a whole bunch of things. So for example... Neurologically. uh, There is a drug that stops glutamate from binding. It's called an NMDA antagonist and it's known as... Ketamine. Ketamine. Now, as we know, ketamine has... I mean, it's a disassociative. So basically gives you this out-of-body experience because it's not just about inflammation and pain. My ED, my ED colleagues call it... Um, the K-hole? The K-hole or vitamin K. There you go. There you go. But there is a vitamin K. I oh, know. But, <laughs> but it may sound better if you say, we're just giving the patient some vitamin K. Oh, very true. And then somebody gets the needle out and they give them some vitamin K and they go, they're still in pain. Um, substance P, right? This is interesting because it's mostly associated with the nociceptive pathway. Uh, There are some uh, drugs that are targeting substance P, but at the moment they're not awesome. So we're still trying to find those. Are they used? They're being used in for analgesics. Yeah, in models, in animal models at the moment. Um, Serotonin again. We know we need serotonin for multiple reasons, so you don't necessarily just want to block that. So what we're left with at the end of all of this is pretty much histamine, bradykinin, and prostaglandins, right? These are three of the major pro-inflammatory chemicals that tend to be quite inflammatory-specific. 
Yep. yep. So now we've got some targets. So uh, should we start talking about histamine? We can do that. Since you brought it up first, it's the very first one that's released. Sure, sure. All right, so are there any antihistamine drugs? There are many. All right. So just going back one step, so histamine is a protein. It comes from histidine, so it's modified within Which these is cells. amino acid. Amino acid, yeah. yep. And it is in all, all tissues. It has the possibility to be made in all tissues, but the most common are those that are exposed to the outside world, which, as I said, it's going to be lung tissue, skin tissue, gastrointestinal tract. That's right. where you're going to have the most higher, highest density of histamine. So anything sort of like subendothelial. That's right. Yeah. Now, the cells that hold it most strongly yeah. would be mast cells, basophils, eosinophils. Okay, so mast cells, sorry, mast cells are pretty, they're, they're static Connective tissue, yep. sensory based cells that sort of just sit there and watch. I think they're like but, a, maybe they come from a dendritic origin, I think. Okay, but basophils and eosinophils are actually white blood cells. That's right. And they move through the bloodstream. So they must get called into that tissue. Yeah, and they're going to play an important role with uh, allergy based. Uh, oh, that's what I mentioned earlier. Allergies. Acute inflammation. Right. Yep. Um, also, um, there are. Cells, parietal cells in the stomach yeah. that hold histamine. That's right. And yeah. there's also histamine as a neurotransmitter in the brain. Yeah, very true. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So histamine, there's a whole different subtype of them. Uh, I think there's four different types. Types of what? Uh, histamine and histamine receptors. Oh, Or okay. should I say histamine receptors? Yeah. Okay. However, probably the most important ones will have uh, H2 but that's the receptor where we're, we're talking about um, a antihistamine effect. Okay. Okay. So you're saying that histamine, just like many chemicals in the body, don't just do one thing. It does a bunch of things. And it really depends on the receptor and the tissue that it binds that's to. That's right. So uh, you said there's H1 and H2 receptors. Hey, right? There's H1, H2, H3, H4. Oh, okay. But so clinical uses yep. would be H1 and H2. Right. Not so much 3 and 4. Okay. But in terms of... The H1 effects, which yep. is strongly um, with – well, H1, H2, which is strongly associated with acute inflammation. Okay. How they're actually going to work is they have an effect on endothelial cells or yep. this is where the receptors are. So when you – Which are the cells inside blood vessels. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So when you throw histamine onto these receptors, it causes the, the blood vessels to dilate. Right. We spoke okay. about that, yeah. And that would lead to the redness. Now, if you were to look at – so at the skin level, if you were to induce – a histamine response, right. and sometimes they do this with allergy checks, they will scrape onto the skin a bit of allergen. Mm -hmm. So these would be dust mite, cat fur, Your um, facial peanut, hair. Peanut, <laughs> peanut, peanut protein, yep. anything that has the potential to be allergen-like. Yep. Allergenic. And, allergenic. And so what they can see is the effect that histamines having on that tissue. Yeah. And what you would see is something called a wheel and flare. Okay. Okay, so that kind of looks like a redness spot mm -hmm. with a bump on it, like a blister almost, and that's telling you that you're responding to that allergen. With, an inflama with a local inflammatory right. response. So right. the reason for why you're getting those things is, well, we spoke about it, you're getting vasodilation, but you're also getting increased vascular permeability. That's why it's getting like a blister. Yeah, because the fluid's leaking out. And then also it's activating or sensitising the nerves, the sensory nerves in that area, yep. which is why you start to feel itchy. Right. So gotcha. that's the classic histamine response to an allergen. So, and this is when histamine binds to H1? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Then you also will have an effect with um, the bronchioles and that would lead to bronchioconstriction. Okay. Okay. Then it can have effects... Or histamine also have it effects in the brain and that gives a sense of wakefulness and I think it also plays a role in um, appetite. So what I'm hearing here is that histamine tends to be released most often from an allergen, not just from, but I mean it can happen through trauma and, and like you yeah, said, yeah. thermal mechanical, It plays a significant. Injury. But often when it's released we tend to get the inf an inflammatory response that we often associate with the inflammatory response from an exposure to an allergen. So things like, you said, itchiness, um, vascular permeability, 
uh, increased blood flow to an area. So redness, itchiness, the airways close off a little bit. So restriction with breathing. Um, and what about when it comes to if it's inhaled, right? This Yeah, yeah. Because so- many of these allergens tend to be like pollens in spring. It's going to hit the mucosa, and so it's going to get the blood vessels in the nose. So then the blood vessels in the nose will dilate. That's right. And so they're the common allergy, uh, allergen responses. So when so, we get edema, or instead of getting edema in the skin, where we get the blister, if we get edema in the nose, we make snot. That's right. Right. So and your nose will block. blocked. Yeah. Because of but, the constriction. But also all around the conjunctive of your eyes. So your eyes are going to get red and run. And itchy. And itchy. Yeah. And your upper airways. Yeah, close off a little bit. That's right. So you're going to get coughs. You're going to get, yeah, a whole lot of um, fluid Mm. and that's going to be highly annoying for the individual. So histamine is very much pro-inflammatory in response to allergens. That's right. All right. Now in terms of the antihistamines. All right, so there's a drug to go against them. That's right. I've taken one before. So there are... Generally, two categories of antihistamines. Yeah. There are the first generation All right. and then there's a second generation. The first generation don't have – their specificity is not as good, but they're also lipid-soluble, much more lipid-soluble. Okay. So, therefore, they can cross the blood-brain barrier. Oh, okay. And as I said earlier, histamine is also a neurotransmitter. Oh, and it's an excitatory one too, so it w- could lead to drowsiness. That's right. So, drowsiness – and changes in appetite. Right. So these can be the side effects. But interestingly, because there's a lot of crossover, they're also going to have an effect on, they almost have an anticholinergic effects. Oh, so what do we need acetylcholine for? Acetylcholine has plays an important role in the parasympathetic nervous system. Oh, so rest and digest. Yeah. So they're going to cause, well, they actually have an effect on anti-nausea. So sometimes a drug, an off-target effect could be it could be used for motion sickness yeah. and anti-nausea. Okay. But a side effect of that would be you maybe also get drowsy. Yeah. And yeah. so one of the most common uh, antihistamines that are used for this, particularly in children, is phenergan. Yes. And okay. Because yes. that's got a sedative property, but it's also got maybe useful um, travel sickness. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you're saying that... Uh, the histamine, so the non-specific earlier generation of histamines, uh, lipid soluble, didn't just have the anti-inflammatory effects, but had these various off-target, probably neurological based effects. Yeah, and in, you may know this. I couldn't really find the mechanism, but they can be also used in Parkinsonian effects, like the uh, maybe not the tremor, but the the stiff muscles and so forth. Have you come across that in your? Because you did your PhD in Parkinson's. Yeah, I'm just trying to think uh, about the cholinergic effects that you stated. So you said it's anticholinergic? Yeah. Uh, interesting. It so, seems to work in synergy with levodopa, but yeah. I didn't look it extensively. So if, it could be because of its anticholinergic effects. So the anticholinergic, because we know we need acetylcholine when it comes to muscle contraction uh, and collagen, uh, and acetylcholine uh, is an excitatory neurotransmitter in many parts of the body. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's its effect because at the end of the day, when you look at disorders and diseases like um, certain neurodegenerative ones like Alzheimer's, it's an imbalance uh, where the acetylcholine is off and the same thing can happen with Parkinson's disease. Yeah. It's not just the dopamine that's out, it's the acetylcholine that's out right. as well. And so it could potentially be that effect, modulating it by changing the acetylcholine. Yeah. But I'm just guessing, I'm absolutely First principles. just guessing off yeah. that. Um, all right, so... These tops, because, but you said earlier that there's uh, histamine in the parietal cells of the stomach. Yeah. So what do the parietal cells do? Is that relevant at all with antihistamines? Yeah, yeah. So uh, with the parietal cell, they're getting stimulus from the uh, muscarinic receptor. Yeah. So from the vagus nerve. Yeah. Yeah, acetylcholine. But they're also getting uh, a stimulus from gastrin. Okay, yeah. Which is, they tell these parietal cells they need to make more acid. Yes, it's time but, to digest, basically. But they also have the H receptor there for histamine. All right. And if you were to block that, the parietal cells, in theory, won't make as much acid. Ah, so histamine helps stimulate hydrochloric acid production and release. So, so. if you had patients with maybe gastric ulcer disease or gourd, too much acid 
um, reflux, mm. you could give this particular type of um, antihistamine and it would reduce the profile of production of acid in the stomach. So effectively it's a proton pump inhibitor. Yes. But Effect by, by outcome. Yeah. But, but not by directly inhibiting the proton pump. Correct. But yeah. you brought that up. So the PPIs, the protein pump inhibitors, are much more effective um, at just that one effect. Yeah. Whereas if you give a antihistamine for the antacid effect, mm. it is going to cause other systemic problem so the yes. person may not want to take it for that reason yeah and i think it's important to state that it's through another receptor not the same receptor that's used as the antihistamine taken for uh, allergic responses right yeah so it's a, it's having a different effect so for example you can't just take zyrtec and expect it to reduce no, your acid production right. so that again that's important because it's all about the receptors zyrtec for example or telfast or uh, what's it called claritin 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 um they all tend to work by binding to, is it H1 specific? No, oh, they're H2. H2 specific. So they're much more for allergy-based right. inflammation. And because... Mucosal. H2, so these are the, the second generation antihistamines. Yep. They're not as lipid soluble, so you're not getting the sedative effects. Yes. And so these seem to be... So these would be loratadine, fexofenadine, uh, sertazine. So these, the brand names here would be Telfar, Zodiac, Claritine. Yeah. These are much more just allergy specific mm. with less side effect profile. All right, cool. And so some of the some of the some of the antihistamines you'll see in the first generation would be thrown in to um, cold and flu tablets, right? Because when you take a cold and flu tablet, which I think they've now been de debunked, right? Yeah, yeah. but. You know, your what do you mean by debunked? Well, there's less evidence for their use in the cold and flu indications. I think uh, that it's the pseudoephedrine specifically. Yeah, so pseudoephedrine is a sympathetic um, agonist. Yeah. And the thought was if you take that, what it will do is vasoconstrict to your nasal mucosa and stop blocked nose, running nose, cough. Yeah. But also probably because it's a sympathetic mimic, it's going to give you a bit more energy. Yeah. Um, but the side effect of that, if you were to take that at night, you wouldn't sleep. Yeah. So then, then counter it with the nighttime cold and flu. Yeah. With the first generation antihistamine. That's right. And that gives you a, sed a sedative profile. Yeah. So they're basically, I think they've said that the pseudoephedrine is not really acting as a sympathomimetic. Is that what they say? I don't know. I, that surprised me, to be honest. Yeah. Because I. I, I thought looked, it would have an effect. Yeah, I'd need, I'd need to jump back into it and have a look because I'm not sure what they were stating. But regardless, um, all right, so histamine, we've done? Done. Okay. Bradykinin? Ooh, bradykinin. Do you mean the, what it is or the drugs that... No, let's talk about what bradykinin okay. is. Um, but before we do that, let's stop for a quick ad break. And we are back. I always get surprised at how quick those ad breaks are. Um, thank you for not fast-forwarding the ad break. And if you did fast-forward the ad break, that's fine. I do the same thing when I listen to podcasts as well. So let's talk about uh, bradykinins. So bradykinins, like histamine, are pro-inflammatory, unsurprisingly. They vasodilate. They increase vascular permeability. They promote pain, or at least they uh, change the threshold of nociceptors to make it easier to experience pain. So they tick off all the boxes for all of the... Uh, cardinal signs of inflammation. Now, it's unlike histamine where bradykinins are sitting preformed, unlike histamine where they're sitting preformed in cells like mast cells, for example, bradykinins are, if you take them back to the beginning, they're produced by the liver. Yes. So that means they are only in the blood? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, they're first released into the blood yeah. and become... So, so, they're, so, so they're always in the blood? Well, let's first begin. In the liver, the liver produces these things called kininogens or kininogens. And if the liver produces something that ends in, or if any part of the body, but it often tends to be the liver, produces something that ends in O-G-E-N, it means it's inactive. Right. It needs to be activated. It needs to be generated. That's right. So, well, it's already generated. It needs to be activated. So... Coninogens are made by the liver, released into the bloodstream, and tend to be floating through the bloodstream, but can be deposited in tissues. 
but let's just say it's floating through the bloodstream. Inactive. Inactive. Now there's a, a protease, an enzyme that activates proteins, or at least chops them to activate them, called calicrine. And calicrine is just... Crane. Crane. So okay. calicrine, I, I think it's K-A-L-L-I-K-R-E-I-N. So it is a protease, but it's an inactive protease because this protease is located also in tissues like the pancreas where there's heaps of proteases, but they need to be inactive otherwise they start to digest and break up the pancreas. So you're saying calicrine is in the pancreas or you're just saying protease as examples? No, no, what? So there is calicrine in the pancreas. Oh, okay, wow. But there's calicrine in multiple tissue sites right. but also the plasma. But it's inactive and needs to be activated, particularly that in the plasma, hmm. and it gets activated when tissue is damaged. Right. And the damaged tissue releases these pro-inflammatory chemicals, this soup of chemicals. So all the ones we mentioned? Yep. They will go there and turn the scissors on. That's right. And so now we've got activated calicrine and it will chop the kininogens and turn them into kinins and one of the kinins is bradykinin. Okay. And now, ultimately due to the damaged tissue, we've got activated bradykinins circulating through the bloodstream. So does that mean that do they, the activated bradykinins, yep. do they have any kind of capacity to know where to go or is it just because that area is leaky and well dilated, they just... Flow out. No, no. Basically, the entire function is in the blood vessel. Oh, okay. So, so they bind to receptors of, in the endothelium. They don't necessarily leave. No, they can, okay. and they can sensitize neurons. Right. But generally speaking, they remain in the bloodstream and will bind to receptors in the blood vessel okay. called B1 or B2 receptors. And if you're Australian, B1 and B2 are the bananas, bananas in pajamas. pajamas. Yep. Um, Hopefully we can put some bananas in pyjamas up on the screen for you. Uh, that sounds like a horrible euphemism. Anyway, so we've got B1 and B2 receptors and once the bradykinins bind to these receptors, it results in vasodilation, increased vascular permeability and it can alter the pain perception. And they do have... Similar to histamine. Yeah, and they have a synergistic effect with the histamine. So both of them together do that real dilation yeah. and leakiness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the way I think about it, and it's not entirely correct... But for simplicity's sake, is that histamine and bradykinin are sisters, except histamine is allergen, more allergen specific in regards to its release, and bradykinin is more trauma or damage specific okay. to the tissue. Not trauma, but damage specific to the tissue. But both of them, vasodilation, increased vascular permeability. And one thing I did forget to mention with histamine if you get a profound systemic release of histamine, then you're going to go into a more anaphylactic state, which mm. is the whole, instead of just your nasal tissue and eye tissue having this inflammatory allergy yeah. that's got a runny nose, sneezing, runny eyes, mm. you put it into every blood vessel in the body. Yeah. And so every single blood vessel will dilate which means you'll go into a hypovolemic shock. Yes. So shock. Or distribution shock. Yeah. So shock is when uh, tissues are not being adequately perfused and that means fed blood. And the way we feed blood to tissues is through the blood vessels, obviously, and they need to be of a certain diameter. And if you relax the blood vessel and make the diameter too large, there's not enough pressure behind it to push it to the tissue. And so the tissue doesn't get fed and the tissue can die and that's called shock and it, it, you can get this systemic shock from a full systemic inflammation which is what you're saying yeah, so that's right. if something happens in the body and i'm sure bradykinin plays their role with that oh as, i'm, I'm as sure all of, the of them i'm sure in some way all of them would um in which if somebody has a really strong response to an allergen like a peanut protein and it's ingested that could stimulate inflammation to a multitude of tissues throughout the body. And so that then leads to, vasod like I said, vasodilation to all these tissues. Your blood pressure falls to the floor, obviously, because all the blood vessels are relaxed and you get that um, distribution shock. Yep. So bradykinins really function similarly to histamine in that sense. Um, now, the thing is, if we were talking about drugs that stop bradykinin, so we spoke about antihistamines, do we have anti-bradykinins or bradykinin antagonists or bradykinin receptor antagonists, yes, there is one and they're trying to find others. And so uh, this uh, particular drug is called 
now I'm probably going to mispronounce it, Acadabant, I think that's right, or I think the product name is uh, Firazir, okay. and it's used specifically for hereditary angioedema. So angioedema is when blood vessels dilate yeah. and fluid leaves. It tends to often be gastrointestinal, oh, okay. like localization-wise. So you basically get this fluid leaking out of the blood vessel due to the vasodilatory effects of bradykinin, which makes sense. So it is... So would this be for people with inflammatory bowel disease? No, people just with hereditary angioedema oh, okay. at the moment. Um, and so, but it tends to, it's also been trialed, at least bradykinin antagonists or, brady, or bradykinin receptor antagonists um, for like chronic inflammatory conditions like uh, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. These are chronic inflammatory conditions. Um but we don't really have the results yet to see whether they're effective or not. So maybe in the future we're going to have more bradykinin antagonists or anti-bradykinin mm-hmm. drugs to help inflammation because bradykinin tends to be a more longer term, unlike the histamine, which is released straight away in shorter term. It has to be pre-made or made again, so they could take a, a, a day for the mast cells to remake it all. Yeah. So the bradykinins, um, they're going to be constitutively activated from the damaged tissue response tends to be longer term. So they have been implicated in longer term inflammatory diseases like the arthritis disorders and diseases. Um, So we we have to just wait and see whether there's going to be any bradykinin-based drugs getting released. Something that's important, I think worth bringing up, is that um, ACE, angiotensin-converting enzyme, which is part of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which I'm sure our dear listener is aware, is a mechanism that our kidneys start off... With renin. With renin to increase our blood pressure and blood volume. Yeah. So very quickly, if our blood volume or blood pressure is low, the kidneys release a protein called renin, the liver releases something called angiotensinogen. Together, they they ultimately produce something called angiotensin 1 and then this enzyme which is called ACE, angiotensin-converting enzyme, converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 has a multitude of effects, listen to our RAS podcast, yep. to increase blood pressure, blood yeah. volume. The thing is that ACE actually inhibits bradykinins. Right. Now, if you have hypertension, hmm. you might be given an anti-hypertensive drug that stops ACE. Prills. That's the prills, exactly, the suffix prills. And if you stop ACE you're going to increase the amount of bradykinins. Right. And this can lead to a bradykinin-induced cough due to... So it's bradykinin is the the mechanism that's thought leads to the chronic cough. That's the thought. Yeah. Because of increased bradykinins. And that's just irritating the sensory receptors in the airways. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So I think that's an interesting aside. But anyway... Uh, so does that mean ACE, ACE has a similar effect to the calacrinin, like the... Scissors? No, 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 because ACE doesn't oh. activate bradykinins. It or inhibits a, bradykinins. Or a blocking of that? I don't know the mechanism in which okay. ACE stops. So ACE could potentially block, block that um, Kelly Crean kinin uh, system. Okay. Potentially. I'm not sure. Should have probably looked into that a little <laughs> bit more. But that's our bradykinins. Do you have any more about bradykinins? No, no, I didn't even look at it. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Uh, now we talk about prostaglandins. Very important because one of the most common anti-inflammatory based... So what group, oh, does cool. this, no, what, what group does this sit under? Yeah. Because uh, we're only going to say it once. Prostaglandins. No, but prostaglandins sit under a, a family of fatty um, molecules that play a role well, in... the buns. Infl- <laughs> Icon- icosanoid? Icosanoids. Okay. We won't say it again. Okay. Icosanoids. There we go. Uh, so before um, I, I was talking while Matt rudely interrupted, I was saying that prostaglandins and the drugs that inhibit prostaglandins are some of the most common medications on the planet. And uh, Are they? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think it's the UN or potentially the WHO, not the band, um, have stated that NSAIDs are listed as uh, basic medications in regards to everyone should have access to right. these meds. Okay. Yep. 
So before we talk about the drugs, let's talk about prostaglandins first of all. Now, Matt might want to add some complexity to this, but to put it Don't simply, so. every cell of our body is made up of a phospholipid bilayer, which I'm sure everyone's aware, this fatty two-layer membrane. And if you take that fatty layer, you can actually turn it into something called arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid can create prostaglandins. That's really simple, yeah. right? Because every cell in the body has phospholipid bilayer, effectively prostaglandins are made everywhere in the body. I don't know of a tissue that doesn't produce prostaglandins. Oh, wow. And I looked into that. Okay. So it seems to be ubiquitous, so everywhere. Even though it was first identified in... 1930. Oh. That's, that's what I was going to talk about with the Sorry, icosanoid. Yeah. The icosanoid as a family, which is just a fatty acid derivative, includes prostaglandins, throm- thromboxin, leukotrins and uh, lipoxins. Sorry? Lipo- li- lipoxins. Okay. Okay. Good attempt. Didn't have any examples of that. Even resolvins, but I'll leave that one. I've never heard of... Prostaglandins, thromboxins, leukotrins. We'll just focus on those three. Sure, sure. Like they fit under the family umbrella of the icosanoids. Yep. Okay. Now, it was first um, discovered yeah. or no- noticed yeah. from... Both? Um, s- semen. Not uh, oh, sailors. Right. <laughs> so going back to vitamin Sa- C and semen. sailors, sailors of the nether regions. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. And- <laughs> so they found that um, semen, yeah, if placed on um, uterine tissue, yep. would cause smooth muscle contraction. Right. Yep. And so then they thought it was derived from the prostate gland. Right. And so prostaglandins makes sense. Were st- Chemicals from the prostate gland. And now we know they come from everywhere. Yeah, but I think it's more seminal vesicles in the prostate gland, to be honest. Oh, when it comes to the reproductive, yeah, yeah. male reproductive system. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I think there's more prostaglandins from the seminal, seminal vesicles. vesicles. Yeah. But that's also because it produces most of the uh, fluid. 70%. Listen to our male reproductive system yeah. uh, podcast we did a few weeks ago. But inter- can yes? I just can we just focus for a, a side second yeah. on prostaglandins' effect in semen? Sure. Just we, to, did we talk about we it? We did a little bit. Okay. Prostaglandin's effect mm. in semen would play a role with opening the cervix up so the, the sperm can s- swim through, yeah. but also inhibiting the female's immune response. Ah, so it modulates the female immune response. To so not that, kill the sperm off. Yes, but also irritates the smooth muscle. Yeah. Hence why... But they also, yeah, they, you can give medications um, for pregnant women over term. Yeah, like a prostaglandin drip, yeah. which can... Or even just gel. Oh, sorry, gel. But, uh, not prostaglandin drip. Uh, uh, yes, a gel. gel. Yes. Um, and that gel tends to irritate it, irritate the, the cervical reason, uh, region and the uterine region to help bring, the, bring Bra- on the break contraction. Break the aminoid, the, not aminoid, the amnion sac. Yeah. All right. Is that your side point? That's my side point. Okay, it was well done. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of applause by the uh, by the audience. Uh, yeah. That one person. So we have prostaglandins that are made by the cell membranes from all the tissue of the body. It totally makes sense that if you damage a cell, you're now going to have a perfect substrate to make these prostaglandins. There's a whole bunch of them. Now, you said prostaglandins... Thromboxane, leukotrienes. That's all we're going to focus on, those three. Yeah, so they're the family. I simplify and just say prostaglandins. Uh, and prostanoids, I, I think, is uh, more correct. Correct, and sort of cover all of them as uh, okay. a, and different types because it, it just can get confusing if okay. I say thromboxins. It's up to you how we talk about it. But I, from now on, I personally am just going to say prostaglandins okay. right. to cover all of them. All the bases because then I tend to sit the prostaglandins into two major families. Now, there's actually multiple families of prostaglandins, but in regards to inflammation and what we want to focus on today, let's just say that the prostaglandins that are made in the body can fit within two categories. So let's focus on the very first category of prostaglandins. These prostaglandins are always produced. They're constitutively activated, which means they're always made and they're like so housekeeping Regardless of inflammation or not. Yeah, so this is just you're a healthy, happy young chap like you are now, um, experiencing no inflammation, your body's still going to make these prostaglandins. And what these particular prostaglandins do is 
they help maintain your gastric mucosa. Okay, so you're getting focused on the region now. Well, th- just for two seconds, okay. is that these prostaglandins, you know, you think about, okay, my stomach produces hydrochloric acid. That acid has a pH of between one to three. That can dissolve nails. Why isn't it dissolving my stomach? And the answer is because your stomach has this mucosal lining that protects it. Thank you, prostaglandins. Right, so it's got the outer casing of the stomach, which is exposed to the acid. It's got this thick secretion on it that is mucus-like, but inside that is bicarbonate, which is um, neutralising. And that mucosa is made by prostaglandins. Yep. So that's important, obviously, right? Second one is that prostaglandins maintain renal perfusion. So we mentioned earlier with... um, So blood flow to the kidney. Blood flow to the kidney. Your kidneys need to filter 120 mils of blood per minute. So would you specifically say blood flow to the nephron? Um, I mean, it probably no, does. No, because it plays around with the diameter of the renal artery. Oh, does it? Yeah. Even that far back? Yeah. Wow. It okay. can. But so at the end of the day, 120 mils per minute need to be filtered by the kidneys at the glomerulus, uh, and that needs to be maintained regardless of blood volume and systemic blood pressure. Mm-hmm. So it needs, so the blood vessels entering, like I said, the renal artery, but also the afferent arteriole, they need to be modulated in regards to their diameter. Prostaglandins help do this. Okay. So that's another important And role. is that kind of a fallback mechanism in terms of you should probably have broader homeostatic mechanisms to ensure good flow to the kidneys, but if that's not working, then you rely on this prostaglandin system a bit more. Yeah, so there's a myogenic response that help, you know, if the pressure is high, then the, the muscles will change and reflexively constrict. If the pressure's low, the muscles will change and dilate. And also then the RAS system as well. And the RAS system. But you've also, in addition to the myogenic response, you're going to have other intrinsic and extrinsic responses to help maintain. So there's a lot of uh, redundancy in this system, but prostaglandins are very important. The only reason why I say that is because, I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but it seems that individuals who have problems regulating blood flow to the kidneys, they're going to be most vulnerable to the drugs that impact prostaglandin release. Mm -hmm. And we'll get there? Yeah, yeah. I just want to say because I I know I'll forget it later. That's right. I won't. And uh, (laughs) I probably will know me. All right. And and so, so again, these are prostaglandins. This is all in the one column, right, of prostaglandins. And then these prostaglandins... Has this column got a name? Nope. Oh, okay. Right. I'll tell you about in a sec. These... Now, another type of prostaglandins in the same column... Prostanoids, again, remember thromboxane, there's other ones, but we're just going to say prostaglandins. They promote platelet aggregation. Which means platelets come together holding hands. So clotting. Like ringy, ringy. What's, what's that nursery rhyme? Yeah, keep practicing. What is it? Rosy, pocket full of. Du- I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so nothing like that <laughs> um, They cl- uh, promotes clotting, right? But uh, you could say ringy, ringy, rosy instead of clotting if you want. Yeah. Do you want to do that? No. Okay. Um, and they it also promotes them coming together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like the Beatles. And so they also promote vasoconstriction more broadly and generally. Oh, just on all blood vessels? Well, arterial vasoconstriction, let's just say generally. Okay. Right? Constriction. Yes. Okay. So, so what clotting and constriction. So this, so this uh, column of prostaglandins make our gastric mucosa to protect our beautiful tummy. It allows for blood to go to the kidneys so we can filter all the gunk from the kidneys. I'm using very specific terms here. And it promotes ring a ring a rosy with the platelets, so clotting, and promotes vasoconstriction. That's one column of ones that are always made. Prostaglandins always made. They're housekeeping. They're there to keep us alive and allow for us to maintain some degree of homeostasis. Normality. Normality. All right. On the other side, you've got a whole other set of prostaglandins. They're inducible. So they aren't being made unless they're stimulated to be made. And these inducible prostaglandins are induced through trauma, damage to vascularized tissue. tissue. Okay. And what these prostaglandins do once the damage has occurred is these prostaglandins promote inflammation. They promote pain or nociception. They promote fever. Mm-hmm. Right? So these three important things that we all are aware of when we get tissue damage, right? Prostaglandins are responsible for them. And they also inhibit... When, I say, when you say fever, just to, to annoy you, yeah. that is only localised to the hypothalamus though. 
Yes, that's right. So it's not like prostaglandins are released in your big toe that's got the injury and the prostaglandin floats all the way up to your... Are you sure? That. Yeah, I'm sure. Definitive. Definitively. So you can't have systemic prostaglandins. No, you have you have cytokines yep. that will then go to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus receives these cytokines and says, oh, I must have some kind of tissue injury in the body. I'll make my own cytokines yep. and that will rechange the thermostat. Okay. So cytokines or prostaglandins? Prostaglandins internally within the hypothalamus okay. will do that, but it's do, it's not coming from outside. And that's right. why they're so considered that's an important point. That's why they're considered central cox or cox wait, three. Wait, 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 we haven't got there yet. We haven't got to cox yet? No, we haven't mentioned okay, it at sorry. all. Sorry. Um, Take that part back. Yeah. So that's rewinding. Uh but it, the reason why that's an important point, and I'll, we'll get to that in a sec, uh, is that these prostaglandins, like we've spoken about histamine and bradykinins being released at the site of the tissue injury. But here we're talking about prostaglandins. They are released at the site of tissue injury, but you just alluded that even though the injury could be peripherally, like you could have a cut to your foot, prostaglandins are going to be made in the brain mm. from that cut to the foot. Mm. And this is one of the reasons why they're so important as a target for drug therapies. Okay. But we'll get there in a sec. Now, this, other, this co- column that I'm now on, I said these prostaglandins promote inflammation, pain, fever. They also inhibit platelet inhibition. What does that mean to you? They don't like holding hands. Well, no, they do like holding hands. Prom- so if you inhibit inhibition, what do you think you're going to get? Well, then you'll get the holding hands, right? you get clotting. Yeah. That's right. So, sorry, my, no. Let me go back. I made a mistake there because I'm thinking about the drugs. What these prostaglandins just do is they inhibit platelet aggregation. Yeah, so stop holding hands. Agreed. My bad. So no clotting. So these prostaglandins, stop clotting. Apologise for that. I was getting ahead of myself thinking about the drugs. And they also promote vasodilation. Mm. So quite different to those other ones where we said... The other ones promote platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction. These ones inhibit platelet aggregation and promote vasodilation. <sighs> okay. I apologise. If you watch the YouTube video of this podcast, it'll You'll make sense because I've got an image up for you and I'll try and make this image available on the podcast itself in the show notes. All right. Now we can talk about the fact that because we've got two columns of prostaglandins, the first ones that are always activated for housekeeping to keep you alive, they're made, these prostaglandins, by an enzyme called cyclooxygenase 1, also known as... COX-1. That's right. And the inducible ones, the inflammation, pain, fever, inhibiting platelets, uh, uh, inhibiting platelets and also having vasodilation, that's cyclooxygenase 2, known as... COX-2. So we've got COX-1 and COX-2, which is the original name of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike. And what we want to... Well, we got rid of it. Me too. We now want drugs that inhibit these COX enzymes. Yes. But more specifically, one column over another. Yeah, well, for, for that particular medication, yes. Well, which is inflammation, yeah. which is the focus of today. We don't want right? to kill your kidneys off. But at the end of the day, the anti-inflammatory effect of these particular drugs are all about how good are they at inhibiting COX-2, which is the one that stops inflammation, pain and fever. Right. Does okay. that make sense? Yep. But the thing is, in the process of making these COX enzymes, or making these drugs that stop these COX enzymes, we're finding that some of these drugs inhibit well, COX-1 specifically, some inhibit COX-2 specifically, some inhibit both. So they're not ultimately, you know, too sensitive, too specific, should mm. I say, yeah. These drugs are called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, mm. NSAIDs. And the list of NSAIDs are enormous, but some of the most popular include aspirin, ibuprofen, Teclofenac, naproxen, and the various coxibs, such as salicoxib. Mm. And so they Did all... Did you say aspirin? I said aspirin, yeah. yep, as number number one. probably Was that the first NSAID made? Probably was, right? I think, made I, from the I think isolated. From willow bark tree? Yeah. Uh, so if we have a think about how these uh, drugs work, they just inhibit those cox enzymes. Does it inhibit cox-1 or cox-2 or both? And we can think about the side effects. So if we start with aspirin... Okay. Aspirin is more so COX-1 inhibitory focused. And I said COX-1 makes the prostaglandins that create the gastric mucosa, allow for the kidneys to be fed and promote platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction. Yeah. 
So if you have aspirin that inhibits all of these things, you're going to increase the risk of getting stomach ulcers because the mucosa is not there. You might put your kidneys at risk of getting fed or perfused and you're going to stop platelets from aggregating. Mm. And of these three, stopping platelets from aggregating is pretty good for those who might be at risk of clots, yep. strokes, heart attacks, yep. cardiovascular events. Yep. So this is one of the main reasons why aspirin is more so being used to stop those things as an anti-clotting agent or as a protective medication for people at cardiovascular risk because it's pretty poor at stopping inflammation, pain and fever, which is COX-2 specific. Yeah, and so I think it's important to note here that aspirin in its use for the anti-clotting or the anti-platelet yep. use or clinical indication is usually given in a dose that is considered low dose or sometimes they call it baby, baby, aspirin. baby aspirin. Yeah, mad aspirin. So the reason for that is when aspirin is given, which I think the chemical name is acetyl salicylic acid. Yeah, salicylic acid. Yep. When it's in your blood, so you've ingested it, it's gone through, you've taken it orally. Yep. If you ingested it, it's been absorbed across your gut, mem- gut membrane, gut wall, mm-hmm. into your blood. Yep. Once it's in the blood, it will encounter the platelets. Yep. And then it will instruct the platelets to stop holding hands. Right. Okay, so that's where Still it has that. an effect. Yep. Okay, so that that means the platelets from then onwards, because I think it is a non-reversible response. Yeah, the platelets will forever um, well, for fourteen days stop holding hands. <laughs> yeah, platelets are only have a life span of fourteen. So days. they so for, not forever for, for their for their ever. Oh, okay, which is fourteen days. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, and so until you make new platelets. Yeah. Then, Fourteen days later, then the, the, then the effect will go away. Yes. Now, if you were to take aspirin in higher amounts, oh, go so, on. So let's say well beyond two hundred milligrams, because this would be about eighty low per dose. dose or per day. Um, good question. Probably per dose. Yeah. Yeah. Then the aspirin, the acetyl salicylic acid, yeah, silly, silly acid yeah. will be converted by the liver into just salicylic acid. Right. Yeah. And then that is now more COX-2 specific. So you're saying that the dose, the dosage of the aspirin That's right. changes whether it's COX-1 or COX-2 That's exactly more specific. Right. Yep. And so hence why a high-dose aspirin has been and can be used as an anti-inflammatory, exactly. antipyretic and, and analgesic. Exactly right. So anti-inflammatory stops inflammation, antipyretic stops fever, uh, analgesic stops pain. Um, but we also know that NSAIDs, such as aspirin, can also stop the gastric mucosa from being yeah. made. Yep. And so many people who are on aspirin long-term for the cardiovascular protective effects may also need to be on a long-term proton pump inhibitor, right. a PPI, okay. to protect their gastric yeah. lining. Now, that you might think, what about the kidney injury what, or what about the renal perfusion, kidney perfusion? I think at the moment the evidence, and it, it's always changing, is that Individuals with uh, healthy kidneys and a healthy renal system probably aren't at risk of, uh, of uh, having renal perfusion issues at recommended doses of NSAIDs, but people who have pre-existing kidney disease or kidney injury may be. Okay, so this would be the elderly, those with type 2 diabetes, poorly managed hypertension issues, any kind of under underlying other kidney um, comorbidities, yep. they may be instructed not to use NSAIDs because of the risk of not being able to maintain blood flow. Because as we know, if yep. you stop being able to maintain blood flow, particularly to the nephron, then the cells of the nephron will start dying Yeah, and then you'll lead into a, a, another type of chronic kidney disease. Yeah. Then there's the what they call the traditional NSAIDs, which tend to be non-specific. Uh, and these are generally referred to as ibuprofen, diclofenac, and naproxen. So, in the picture that you're showing, if you're watching this yep. on the YouTube, they sit more in the midline, yeah. halfway between one and two. They block both COX one and COX two, and this is at the recommended doses. So, with can I just ask you a question? Yep. You may not be able to answer this. Yeah. Are these more concerning to the kidney than the COX ones? Or both pretty much the same? Both pretty much the same. Okay. Uh, all of them really. Okay, okay. Uh, but we'll get to, we'll right, get to that point right, in a sec. Right. So because ibuprofen 
um, which I think everyone's aware of, mm. right, because it tends to just be called ibuprofen. Nurofen, Nurofen Advil. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Diclofenac, which is Voltaren. Oh, yep. Uh, naproxen, which are things like naprogesic. Uh, yeah, I don't know any other naproxen. But these are both COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitory. And because they're COX-2, it means they're quite good at stopping inflammation, pain and fever. Um, but they also have their uh, gastric effects. And the kidney effects. And the kidney effects. And the platelet effects tend to, uh, and the vasoconstriction, vasodilatory effects tend to, Balance I don't each other out. Yeah, I don't want to say that they definitively do because that would make people think that, oh, the cardiovascular risk of these non-selective is lower and it's not. Okay. That's the thing. So, Lower than two, you mean? Uh, than selective twos? Yes, which yeah. we'll get we'll to We'll get to now. in a second. Um, we'll, we'll do that now. So there is another, like just I was going to bring this up with ibuprofen. In Australia there was a, um, a court proceeding or case that one of the big um, pharmaceutical companies mm. would market their ibuprofen in different clinical indications. So oh, they would have... Like pain specific. Oh, sorry, yeah, like, like muscle migraine, yeah. headache, um, joint pain, mm. neurofen, whatever, and uh, menstrual pain. Yeah. But they were all the same 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. That's so right. it didn't change. Because they were all oral... <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anti-inflammatory. So it's. Drugs. I guess the point I'm saying, it's not been specific to the type of, let's say, musculoskeletal pain. Unless, yeah. unless you take an ibuprofen patch or diclofenac gel, right? But that would still, I mean, probably remain localized. But you're going to get some absorption, which which would go systemically. Yes. Not to the same level. Yes. But there would but, be still some of that. Yes, but they are used quite effectively, actually, for osteoarthritis of the hip, hands, feet for example, and have reduced side effects. Yep. Uh, all right, so let's talk about now the COX-2 specific. So you'd sit back and go, okay, if all of the anti-inflammatory, antipyretic, analgesic effects are COX-2 specific, we're trying to find as many COX-2 specific drugs as possible. And that's true because the anti-inflammatory effect is all about COX-2 specificity. And we've made some, we've got some, and predominantly they're called the cox um, and were these purely made to overcome the side effect issues of the others? Well, yes, and they were made because they wanted to be as anti-inflammatory specific as possible. But the problem is that when you inhibit COX-2 specifically, you tend to also inhibit the platelet inhibitory effect, which means you yep. promote platelet aggregation. And the vasoconstriction and you, or the dilation. And you stop be, the vasodilation, yeah. which gives... a. a so like a reflexive vasoconstrictive effect. And so while these drugs are great at, as being anti-inflammatory, antipyretic, analgesic, they significantly increase somebody's risk of cardiovascular disease. So and blood that would pressure be like a heart up. attack. Yes, yeah, so blood pressure goes up, risk of stroke and MI goes up. But here's the thing. because So you'd go, oh, okay, then, well... Why take it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually really tricky when we look at all of these NSAIDs because when it comes to cardiovascular risk, there's actually, for any of them except probably aspirin, there is no safe window of dosage for any of them for people who are at cardiovascular risk, right? People who took the COXIBs, COX-2 specific, and diclofenac, which is slightly more COX-2 specific than COX-1, were at a 70% increased risk of having a heart attack compared to people who didn't take any NSAIDs. And a heart attack basically is a reduction of blood flow to the heart muscle, which commonly is caused by a thrombus forming yeah. or at least a narrowing of the blood vessel. Yeah. And so this type of COX-2 specific is kind of doing both in a way, yeah. promoting the possibility of a clot forming yeah. but also narrowing blood vessels. In this case, I guess it could be the coronary artery mm. which would likely increase, like you said, the chances of an ischemic event. Yeah, so the t I think the take-home message here is that uh, even though NSAIDs are mostly over-the-counter, COXIBs aren't, but most of them are, um, it doesn't mean that they're safe for everyone. Mm. That's important because, as we can see, individuals 
uh, NSAIDs can increase your risk of uh, stomach ulcers and gastric effects, like so GIT issues, increase the risk of renal perfusion issues or renal events, and increase the risk of cardiovascular events. That's significant, mm. especially knowing what percentage of the population has pre-existing issues with these systems, right? So people can be at risk of GIT, CVS, and renal events. Um, topical NSAIDs, like I said, the ibuprofen patch, um, ketoprofen patch, the diclofenac, voltaren gel sort of thing, they've shown to uh, reduce pain, particularly osteoarthritis, yep. joint-associated pain, um, with very few adverse effects wow. simply because of it acts at the tissue specifically but does get into the bloodstream, like we said. But this is when we're focusing on things like musculoskeletal pain. Yep. But pain can be more than that. And again... Uh, uh, but we're focusing on inflammation. Yeah. And that's where I'm imagining celecoxib, one of the main reasons for a person taking it would be chronic arthritic pain, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's one of the major NSAIDs for that type of pain. But again, need to be mindful of the cardiovascular risk because there is yeah. no safe window of NSAIDs when it comes to cardiovas- increasing cardiovascular risk. Mm-hmm. So that's super important. Um, so that's the... NSAIDs, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs affecting the prostaglandins. We're now moving on to our last type of uh, anti-inflammatory drug, which is the... Glu- SEDs. Sorry? The SEDs. Oh, God. so the... Okay, we spoke about non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Now we're talking about the steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. How come no one talks about them as the SEDs? I don't know. But you're right, because they're steroidal. Let's, let's start, start it off. So this is... Would you call them... Would you just say steroids or would you call them glucocorticoids or would you call them corticoids? What, what is the name here? What are we calling them? I think the correct term would be glucocorticoids. Right. Um, but they're common, commonly known as the corticosteroids. Right. Or, yeah. So cortico referring to the cortex. cortex of the adrenal gland. Right. But as you know, another hormone, which is also a steroid hormone mm-hmm. that comes out of the region is aldosterone. Yeah. which is a mineral corticoid. All right, so can we go back to just the adrenal gland for a second? Yeah. yeah. So before we talk about – so we have an adrenal gland and that – Two. Ad- oh, we've got two. Yeah. That's good to know. All right. Um, so between us we have three adrenal glands <laughs> um, and the adrenal gland creates a whole bunch of stuff. So steroids, which are made from lipids or cholesterol. Cholesterol. Right. Um, and these steroids tend to be cortisol – Aldosterone. That's it. That's it, okay. And then going further down the pipeline. So you, deeper into the adrenal gland. Still in the adrenal cortex is the uh, androgens. All right, like okay. testosterone. Correct. Okay. And then you go into the medulla, which is not the cortex anymore. Yeah, okay. Which which we make in, you know, uh, noradrenaline. Right. So, But if we're just talking steroids... Testosterone is not a steroid or it is a steroid? It is, it is. Okay. So then you could argue that all the glucocorticoids of the adrenal gland... Corticoids, corticosteroids. Okay. uh, uh, All those three. Oh, yes. Okay. So this is the difference. So you've got got corticosteroids, which are simply the steroids made from the cortex of the adrenal gland. Then you've got the glucocorticoids, which are the steroids that can play around with glucose. Glucose, that's right. Exactly right. And that's why they call that. Cortisol. Cortisol. Only. Only. Right. Because then when you bring aldosterone, it's a mineral corticoid which plays around with... Sodium and potassium. Hence that's right. mineral. And water. Yeah, All right. Exactly. So that was for everyone else, not me. <laughs> so what you're saying is we're now talking about an anti-inflammatory drug which is called the glucocorticoids because they act like cortisol. Exactly which, right. Which plays around with glucose homeostasis. That's right. Why? Why are we looking at this particular one? What is the role that it plays? And why is cortisol important here? Well, I guess in this case with cortisol, you know, you release, release this out of your adrenal cortex all the time. Um, predominantly, it's more in abundance in the morning. Yeah, it's diurnal. And it, then it kind of tapers away. Yeah. Um, but it's always in your blood and it plays a role in, you know, just maintenance of homeostatic uh, processes. Now, one of its main roles is to play around, play around with glucose within the blood. Now, it does this by countering insulin, okay? So oh, okay. it has a... Insulin, 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 
insulin insensitivity. Okay, and it will and function. And high amounts will actually almost put you in a diabetic state right. of its effect countering insulin. Yeah. So what it will kind of do is it will try to utilize or try to get the liver to make glucose from a non-carbohydrate source. Okay. So proteins and fat. Yeah. So it will play a role with recruiting fatty acids from fat tissue and also pulling amino acids from proteins and throwing it at the liver to say, make more glucose for me. So this is the way I talk about it. So I, on Instagram, I was asked this question about the functions of cortisol. And I think you and I did a podcast on it. I think the conclusion that you and I came to is that, you know, in times of, because we think of cortisol as a stress hormone, but cortisol is released in response to stress, doesn't cause stress, right? So we, yeah, yeah. Now, and when we say stress as, you know, a, biologists, we don't mean the stress of a work deadline per se. We mean physiological stress, yeah. which means any time your body is trying to get pushed out of homeostasis. So when this stress occurs, our body will release cortisol, but at the same time it will also release adrenaline, which is part of the sympathetic nervous system. The way we, okay, we yeah. tend to look at it is that the sympathetic nervous system with adrenaline and noradrenaline, it functions to respond to that stress and keep us alive in that moment mm. and the cortisol is released to make sure that after that moment is finished we're in the best situation possible to go back to normal after the stress and so what you're talking about now is that what cortisol can do is it stops glucose from being sucked into the cells and stays in the bloodstream while simultaneously mobilizing energy sources from fat and proteins to also be chucked into the bloodstream so that once the stressful situation is over, you now have as many energy sources as possible available to you in the bloodstream to fix yourself, rebuild, repair, get yeah. ready. That's how I see it because with any other lens or context, it makes no sense because it might mobilise all these energy sources but also makes you not able to use it in that moment. Yeah, I did think about that and I just wondered maybe in the moment that you can still... Because to be honest, the only cells that would be now insensitive to glucose would be fat and muscle, right? Yep. But if you were in a stress response, and let's just say it was the typical response that everyone thinks of, if you would now have a, a high physical demand, yeah. my understanding is skeletal muscles can then shift to be insulin um, insensitive or not specific, right? Yeah. So they can actually start sucking glucose up without the need of insulin. But remember, if you're in that situation, your muscle will have enough glucose for itself. Okay. So it won't require that glucose from the bloodstream. So that glucose from the bloodstream is simply a pool for when for the stress situation is yeah. over to provide the ATP required to potentially fix the body if it's damaged. Yep. Right? Now, in conjunction with that, and I think that's well explained, is oh. that it will hey, can tell... We just stop for a second and focus on that? It will tell the body. There's a few other things that I don't want you to worry about. Um, one Do you want to me specifically? No, no, like the, what? the body during, oh. dur during a higher degree of cortisol release. Oh, yeah. One being... Let's not worry about inflammation at the moment. Mm. Turn that system off. Yes. And also let's suppress the immune system. And again, the reason why is a lot of... We spoke about this at the beginning, right? Where the thing that happens during inflammation is that the energy, you go into an energy conservation mode and you divert resources to the immune response. So it's very energy hungry inflammation yeah. and so is an immune response. So cortisol goes, well... We need this energy elsewhere. I'm going to suppress the immune system, suppress inflammation. And again, it's about trying to put you in the best situation for afterwards. And then people who take medications uh, that promote a lot of cortisol or cortisol-like effects, mm. they will also tell you that they have trouble sleeping yep. and they're highly energetic and almost euphoric. Yeah. So my guess there would be if you're in that kind of survival mode, you probably want to remain awake and you want to be highly functioning yeah. to get out of that issue that you're in. Yeah, because cortisol can have effects at the hypothalamus and help promote the release of adrenaline or adrenaline as well. Yeah, I think it, I think it kind of um, synergizes it, it right? Does. And same yeah. with the um, hormones from the thyroid. Yeah. All this 
kind of amplifies the effect of the sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. So, and this would probably not last within minutes. It's probably going to go hours to days, short, you know, not, not a lot of days. Yeah, you're but talking about from a, a, a normal stress response or you're talking about taking a cortisol? No, no, just a normal drug. response, but a yeah. significant one, right? Yeah. Like it could be over a number of days where you are. Yeah, I'd probably say out. Hours. Yeah. I would say, uh, I mean, I would say that the a, a, acute phase of it would be hours, but probably going back to normal would be potentially days mm. in regards to, you know, going back to the normal blood glucose. Well, that would happen pretty quickly. Yeah, look, I'd probably say hours, in all honesty. Um, but the, I think the main point we're trying to get across here is the fact it can suppress inflammation. Yes. And, and the main thing is it's doing that again so that we've got the energy to help fight and then repair after the fact. So w what we've now done is we've figured out how to make drugs that mimic this cortisol-like effect that we call glucocorticoids. Yeah, and the, generally the way they're broken down in the medication categories are based on their how long they last. Yeah. So you have your short-term, you have your intermediate, and you have your long-term glucocorticoids. Mm. Yeah. And usually as you go up the scale of duration, they're all, all also more potent. So you'll have cortisone, yep. which is a low, probably close to one and one cortisol yep. level, but that needs to be converted to hydrocortisol, yep. hydrocortisone cortisone, yep. to be basically the same as cortisol. Then you go to the intermediate ones, which is like prednisone, and they're somewhere between three to five times more potent than cortisol. Yep. And then you go to the longer lasting ones, which is beth. Uh, Betamethacin or dexamethacin, yeah. which are like 20 times more powerful than cortisol. Yes. And their function is the way that they work is they don't, they don't act like antagonists or stopping the direct synthesis through an enzyme. They actually go to the source, right? They go to the DNA. DNA. Yeah, and, it's, and it's interesting, glucocorticoids will block 1% of your genome. Wow. Which tells you that 1% of the genome is dedicated to all of these functions. Yeah. And, then, and with this, it doesn't mean that it's just for um, anti-inflammatory. It also means it's stopping the homeostasis of bone. Yeah. It's going to stop the way that your immune systems. So all the things that it will do it is with T and B cells. Neutrophils and no longer um, kind of bind to endothelial cells yep. on, on, the blood, on the blood vessels. So they don't kind of stay ready to go out into the local tissue because they're an important phagocyte. phagocyte. Um, they will reduce, yeah, the activity of neutrophils, um, macrophages, mast cells. They'll decrease T helper cells activity. They'll decrease. They do boost some immune cells. Okay. So it's not all about suppression. It's just about modulation. But most of it is suppression. And then all the mediators that we spoke about, so the prostaglandins, both at the source of they no longer produce the, the COX enzymes but yeah, also right. the um, arachidonic acid precursors, yep. the, the way that the, all the interleukins and so forth. So all these are stop made. Yeah. And so this is why it would be useful as an anti-inflammatory. But unlike the... Other two, like the antihistamines or the uh, NSAIDs, yeah. these are doing like everything. Yeah. So it's kind of doing a, a whole cloth res response to it all. I think it's. I think you made this point. It's that meme where the guy's slapping the tape onto the the hole that's in the big water tank, mm. and uh, the way I think about um, the drugs that target prostaglandin, like NSAIDs. And you know antihistamines and the bradykinin antagonists, they're sort of you know there's the hole in the water tank and the water's squirting out. They're sort of a bucket catching that water, stopping it from having any more effects than it already has. When the glucocorticoids are slapping the tape on the hole, it's stopping it at its source. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so th the main function here is it goes to the DNA, stops the because remember DNA needs to be transcribed into RNA and needs to be translated into amino acids, which then fold into functional proteins. And these might be enzymes, like, like you said, the COX enzymes. Uh, it could potentially be ultimately prostaglandins. It could be histamines and bradykinins and T cells and B cells. It could be a whole range of things. And so it's just stopping that effect. Hence the reason why you said sometimes these effects can last more than hours but days because if it's stopping the transcription 
and ultimately translation, uh, there needs to be a half-life to it, right? Um, so if somebody takes, so you said that you've got the shorter terms, which is cortisone, hydrocortisone, intermediate terms, prednisone, for example, long-term like de- dexamethasone, um, the side effects of these things, right? Well, firstly, the indication. So why would a person want oh, yeah. to take glucocorticoids? Yeah. So one being asthma. Let so me guess, inflammation. Yeah. Well, let's start with asthma. Okay. Asthma, arguably, um, for many people, is, is uh, ectopic. What's um, that mean? Or, no, sorry, not ectopic. Atopic. Atopic. Uh, which atopic? Yeah. Which is um, allergy based. Okay. Okay. Which means that the bronchioles will start to fill with fluid mm-hmm. and kind of restri- so you have a, an important inflammatory base to it. Mm. And so, if you were to give um, patients either topical. Oh, it's a bit hard when it's in the airways. Yeah. So topical. I mean, Drink this. Gel. Topical would be through inhalation. Inha- that's what I mean. Inhale yeah. this. Gel. So you inhale this spray. Yeah. Um, so this would be what we call preventers. Yeah. And so that would be maybe bethamethasone. Yeah. Um, and that's or beclomethasone, which is taken in and that kind of lines the airways and that does the role of preventing those pro-inflammatory mediators to cause inflammation and airway edema and so forth, mucus yep. production. Yep. And so asthma is a, a, an important use for that. And so if you get real bad exa- exacerbations, you may then revert to oral uses like prednisone. Which you can inhale. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I know it's taken orally. Aren't, but there, aren't there steroids that can be – aren't there puffer well, the, steroids? Yeah, the, the ones I spoke about already, the beclomethasin – but I'm not sure prednisone specifically oh, okay. maybe take orally. Yep, yep. Now, one side effect because you're also Systemic inhi- inhibiting the immune system, even with the spray, mm. is your whole airway is now immune suppressed. Oh. So they have a Thrush, risk of, yeah. Bacterial infections, right. fungal infections. Fungal infection. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. So then you have the autoimmune conditions. So, okay. so this could be um, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, exacerbations of MS. Yep. Um, those things, because they've got an inflammatory basis to it, the, these individuals may Steroids. take glucocorticoids for that. Yep. And then you have all the skin conditions, which are generally inflammatory based, right? Yeah. When you look at eczema and um, dermatitis, yeah. you're just trying to get rid of that redness and itchiness mm. and you just put you know, hydrocortisone on. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then what are going to be some of the side effects? Well, it kind of goes to what's the side effects uh, endogenously if you produce too much cortisol. Okay, so uh, this can play around with your glucose. Well, what's the condition called, do you know, when you produce too much cortisol? Uh, Hypercortisolism. Yeah, which is sometimes known as Cushing syndrome. Yeah, so... So you're producing a possibility of a cushion state. All right. So that could include uh, mismanagement of your blood glucose. Yeah. Uh, it can change around with the mobilization of nutrients, so like fats. So it can change the distribution of fat. Distribution of fat. For some reason, you get the uh, camel hump. Buffalo. Right? Buffalo. Hump. Buffalo hump. <laughs> <laughs> it's one, one of the humps, um, which is just behind the neck. So for some reason you get a fatty between pad build-up. Yeah, between the shoulder blades. Yep. Um, Moon face, I'm not sure if that also is a fat distribution change. Not it's fluid? Prob- probably also fluid. Yeah. Yep. So because, But isn't that because cortisol, because it's released right next to its um, mineral cortisol. I think cortisol brother, also has a, a lower has but a mineral still a mineral effect. That's right. Which means it can act similar to... Aldosterone, right. which means it reabsorbs sodium, making more water be stored in the body or held on to. And again, probably with the fact that various nutrients are being distributed differently, this might change the distribution of the fluid as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else is there? Well, because you're catabolizing skeletal muscles, they get skinny legs. Yep. Yeah. And so also, weight loss. Oh, yeah. but fluid will be maintained, so possibly not. But also it, the fat distributes differently so yeah. they can get a big belly as well. Okay. And they get kind of the stretch marks because of the way that I think um, the protein collagen it forms or it doesn't form within your skin. So are you now talking about people who have hypercortisolism endogenously or are you well, talking about people who have taken too many exogenous uh, that, steroids? That can also cause that, yeah. Okay, okay. Obviously dose... Specific and uh, immune suppression issues, so yeah. increased likelihood of infection. 
Yes, that's right. That's yeah. a big one. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, is that it? That's it. Wow. And we're done. That's pretty good. How, how long that so, one? It's so a, do a, okay, nearly two hours. That's pretty good. A wrap-up? Um, okay. I think the, the wrap-up ultimately here is that when you have damage to vascularized tissue, whether it be thermal, chemical, mechanical, whatever, you are going to get a soup of inflammatory chemicals being released. These chemicals predominantly result in vasodilation, increased vascular permeability, increase the likelihood of experiencing nociception and subsequently pain and potentially loss of function of that area. And these are the cardinal signs of inflammation. If we want to address inflammation, we need to try and do something about these chemicals, either stop their release or stop their binding. And this is where we've come across some of the most important anti-inflammatory drugs on the market, which includes the antihistamines, those that focus on stopping bradykinins, the NSAIDs, and the steroids, which are but it's the important to say with the antihistamines, they're not really that effective with the same kind of inflammation pain. No, that we spoke about of allergy specific. It's more, yeah, it's it's much more allergy specific types of inflammation, mm. like we spoke about earlier. Exactly. Um, all right, we have some. And, and the other thing mail. that I'll just say as we have some listener mail. We got listener I don't know. Mail. You might push back on this point. Maybe. What are you going to say? I think it's also important just to state that we mentioned at the start that inflammation is a body response to injury mm -hmm. and it plays an important role in recovery and repair. Yep. And so it's not always advisable necessarily oh, to yeah. try to inhibit this response because part of your resolution and recovery requires you to go through the inflammatory response. Yep. So Absolutely you shouldn't agree. necessarily try to inhibit it every time you have acute inflammation. Maybe if it's going to cause more problems, it's... Like it's I said in, at the beginning, it's yeah. context dependent yeah. because sometimes acute inflammation needs to be knocked on the head. Sometimes it can be left alone, right? Yeah. And um, you know, sometimes you don't want to inhibit the inflammatory response because it might lengthen the recovery time yes. or repair time. But again... The question might be, well, how do I know when to do that? And the answer is maybe you don't. Maybe you need to see your doctor and say, I've got this particular inflammatory response. Is it worth me taking NSAIDs or not? Right? Or I've had this inflammatory response and it's lasted six months. Did what you do I do? Talk about your rash? Yeah, well, let's not bring that up again. Am I ready first? Yeah, you can I'll start. read first. Okay, this one uh, is, well, it states, Hi, Dr. Matt. Hmm. Okay. Hi, Dr. Matt. All right. Anyway, I'll just move on. Uh, just wanted to say hello and let you know that both you and Dr. Mike, all right, could have emailed it to me. Uh, I think it was sent, sent to both of us, but you don't check your emails. Maybe. That's correct. Uh, uh, absolutely saving my life and sanity at the moment. I start a new job as a trainee nurse practitioner in September and there's just so much to learn. So this is from Marie. Uh, like you don't already know, there is a lot. That's for sure. Uh, Matt and I are always learning. I promise you that. I absolutely love listening to your podcasts. You both keep me company in the car and it's made learning tricky topics that little bit easier. I have my OSCE exams in a few weeks, so we'll see how it goes. I suppose I just wanted to say thanks for going to the trouble of sharing your expertise and time to teach idiots like me who are a million miles away. Don't say that. The only idiot I know is sitting next to me. If you're ever over in Manchester, I absolutely owe you a drink. Thanks again and keep doing what you're doing. Take care, Marie. Thanks, Marie. And if I do go to uh, Manchester, which I believe is in England, well uh, done. I will... Isn't that your favourite football team? Um, I don't follow Manchester United. You don't, sport. You don't, yeah, that's right. You <laughs> play, play sport, it. but you don't like it. I'm very good at sport. I'm probably the best you know. Uh, but I can beat you golf and cricket. Oh wow! Two sports that I wouldn't even call a sport. <laughs> wow! Oh, I can beat you at you're hitting, gonna, you're, you're hitting a ball with a weird shaped stick. You're going to attract what you're criticism via emails, and I'm the only one that reads them. All you can do is hit an oddly shaped ball with an oddly shaped stick. What about tennis? You love tennis. I'm way better than you at tennis. And it, that's the most oddly shaped stick. Inc incorrect. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Marie. Matt, what do you got? Okay. This is from Callan. Callan's subject here is cardiology and pathology. Hello, fine gentlemen. I'd, I, I'd love to hear you guys talk about cardiology, cardiopathology slash pharmacology. Keep up the good work, guys. 
the notification of a new episode makes me so damn happy every time. Oh, Cheers, nice. Cal from Tassie. That's Tassie awesome. is Tasmania. That's true. I know a Cal from Tassie, so I wonder. I think I, I think this is the same Cal. I think this is the Cal that actually helped make our. He made our. Uh, his brother made our wooden um, plaque. Plaque. Which the, we still the, have to the frame. The YouTube button, we, which we had to take down off the wall. Because it keeps falling down because it, keeps falling it doesn't down. stick to the back of it because it's lacquered. That's right. So, Kel, please remember, the reason why it's not on the wall at the moment is because we need to simply drill a hole and we just haven't done that yet. Um, but, yeah, we should, we've should. we done some cardio stuff, but we haven't done – we've done some um, antihypertensive stuff, right? So uh, – We'll do anemia. How's that? Is that cardiology? Not right. No, no. no. that's hematology. All right. Natalie, email from Natalie. Dear Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike, my name is, uh, sorry, Natalia. This is my fault, Natalia. Uh, my name is Natalia and I'm currently an undergraduate student in the United States. I'm going to put an accent on now. At Vanderbilt University. I recently got my results, but no, that's is it starting southern? to sound. It's at the southern. Where's Vanderbilt University? I'll Google it. You, you, you figure that one out. Um, I recently got my results back for my secondary school, International Baccalaureate. Oh, awesome. Um, so the International Baccalaureate is so that you can basically get accepted into any university globally, right? That's, I think that's what the International Baccalaureate is, um, that I took in spring, and one of those exams that I took was higher-level biology after two years in the class. Oh, you, right. you were fairly right, Nashville. Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> I hope that my <laughs> accent is correct and not condescending or rude. Um, and one of the exams was... More, more emails, more emails. <laughs> <laughs> Higher level biology after two years. This is high school. That's I, I never would have done that. So I watched your video. Was high school? Well, <laughs> I barely finished high school in all honesty. I definitely wouldn't have been able to do the international baccalaureate and do higher level biology for two years. Um, I watch your videos every day up until that exam. I've never considered myself to be strong in science, but I could always understand uh, even some of the more complicated lectures because of the talent you both have for teaching. That's very kind. Um, and this is a well-worded email for somebody who's just finished high school. This is, I wish I was as switched on as you, Natalia, when I was your age. I ended up getting a 6 out of 7 on the exam, which is 95th percentile. Wow. Because I learned so much from watching you all teach uh, than I did it. Then I did in two years of class and lab. Because of my score, I was able to test out of the science requirement at my university and focus my energy on my area of study, which is actually music performance. Oh, how cool is that? I'm now in a degree path path, sorry, um, that I would never have been able to enter without your help. Moreover, your videos actually gave me a new interest in health science, so I'm now studying public health in addition to music, which is something I never thought I'd be able to do. This is why we do what we do. It's pretty it's right. it's pretty incredible for us. And with the music part, you can possibly help us with a um, jingle for the yes. mailbag. Right. Mailbox. N- Nat- <laughs> Natalie, <laughs> can you can you create a little theme song for us to play, like a jingle for when we go to read these mailbag um, mailbox? Emails. Emails. Stop making me sound mailbag. I've recently recommended your YouTube channel to <laughs> my that friends last week. who are pre-medical <laughs> students <laughs> and I'm sure their grades will start to soar once watching videos. Thank you for everything that you do and for inspiring us to learn. Wow, Natalia, thank Ch- you so champion. much. Champion. Thank you so much. Uh, makes us feel so happy. Um, got one more. Uh, this is from... Notice I'll give you the long ones. I know. It's okay because the long ones are always quite kind. Um this is from uh, Preeti. Uh, Preeti says, hi, Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike. Just wanted to say hello. I'm a nobody from Perth. Don't say that again. The only nobody I know is sitting right next to me. And I'm going to get more emails because people think I bully Matt. Uh, I'm a nobody from Perth. Uh, did sta- you see the Twitter post I did this week? Oh, what was that? Oh, was that with me as Scarface? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That was quite good. What did it say? Oh, that you won a award of belittling your... Colleague, <laughs> that's right. Podcast host. If there was a uh, biggest bully in you'd, the podcast, you'd take world, it out. I would, and I'd take you out. By darn it, um, studying uh, medicine at Perth at the uh, vintage age of thirty-seven. That's okay. That's my age, uh, or thereabouts. After a life-changing event where I lost my little girl to a rare condition and changed my life trajectory from being a physiotherapist of ten years to now as a medical student at uni. Wow. Um, I honestly, I don't know how. Mm. I, I don't know. Both Matt and myself have uh, girls. Um, I would have. That, I, I don't even know what to say. I, I couldn't even begin to um, 
feel what you would have gone through. So, and the fact that you've been able to change your life trajectory, go from physiotherapy to medicine, and then at the age of 37, no, I think that's amazing. Amazing, yeah. Um, I haven't done any anatomy or physiology for decades, so I was looking for videos and podcasts for my one and a half hour commute to uni, and I just got hooked on your podcasts. I don't think I could have survived spending three hours on my commute, if not for you guys. Thank you so much. Um, I always have at least one to two hours of podcasts before every body system block to listen to, and it honestly gives me an edge over my peers. Awesome. I wish I could thank you in person, but you know this world is very small and who knows, perhaps one day that might be possible. I promise to introduce myself first though, so I don't startle you guys. That's okay. I get people coming up to me all the time um, who end up saying, are you Dr. Mike? Thank you so much for what you do and keep giving shit to Matt because none of us like him. Um, P.S. One topic I struggled to find a lot of information uh, on was ossification. So endochondral and intermembranous uh, ossification and perhaps it's too niche, but I don't think so because... We've done one on skeletal, um, but we might need to redo skeletal system because I think it was ages ago. This is pretty much embryology though. Ooh, we'll never do that. Uh, Otherwise, you guys are amazing. Uh, I've been trying to tell the faculty at Notre Dame that they need to invite you both as guest lecturers. Hey, get that sorted. Do we know anyone at Notre Dame? Notre Dame? Notre Dame. Not in Perth. No. A number of my friends went through the one in Sydney. Oh, yeah. We should start to do tours. Why don't we go around the country and deliver podcasts and seminars and workshops for all of these students who can't afford to pay us? Because we would ask for tens of thousands of dollars to do you this. Would. Yeah. Matt would do it for free, but not me. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a money-hungry man. Uh, anyways, this has become quite a lengthy email. Um, and uh, just wanted to, uh, your audience branches across all age groups, culturally diverse groups, and I guess in my case, strange convoluted backstory groups. Take care and know that you've added value in the world in a way not many can do so. Thank you so much, Preeti. I truly... Lovely email. We truly They're appreciate it. They're all great it. emails. They are. And if you do want to send us an email, please feel free. Uh, go onto our website, which is Dr. Matt, Dr. Mike dot com dot au you can send us an email from there or you can go to gu biosciences at gmail dot com uh, and send us an email uh, whether it be a thank you or a i hate your guts or let's get rid of matt or a suggestion for a topic you can follow me on social media or a jingle or a jingle email us a jingle you can make us another plaque are we going to get a gold plaque oh i thought you meant your atherosclerotic one. Oh no not that one <laughs> i'm i'm taking statins for that so what I need is uh, a jingle for the mailbag. Got to stop saying mailbag. Uh, and we should be getting a gold plaque when we hit a million YouTube subscribers. We are at 600,000. So a little over halfway. So tell everyone you know to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yep, which if you're watching, you don't need to, but it's Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike. Then we'll get a gold plaque. That's it. Apart from that... Thanks, Matty. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, And we'll speak to you soon. Hi, everyone. Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.